guys, it's Ryan Bridge the Bug Man, and I'm in the studio today, and I'm bringing to you a ton of cool bug fun. If you don't know who I am, people call me the Bug Man, and they call me the Bug Man because I go to schools and churches and libraries and birthday parties and all kinds of cool places, and what I do, I teach people all about insects. Man, I bring the bug fun to you guys. And today, we are talking about butterflies and moths also known as Lepidoptera, okay? That's probably the biggest word I'm gonna use all day long. So, there you go, butterflies and moths. You like them or you don't like them. Most people love butterflies. Some people don't like moths. Did you know there's a phobia called motophobia? It's the fear of moths. And I laugh at that because I can't imagine having something like that because moths and butterflies are so, so cool. So let's get into nuts and bolts, man. Let's get this done. Most people get confused over the differences between butterflies and moths, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But I want to go into something real quick, and this is going to go deep for a minute. I want to make sure everybody understands. Look, there are some, there are some real serious scientific and hardcore research being done on genetics. I'm talking DNA studies. And those individuals are finding out Stay with me on this. Those individuals are finding out that they're all moths. In the, in the big picture, butterflies don't even exist as as a as a science, you know, as a scientific thing. The truth is though, we're still going to call them butterflies. We're still going to call them moths and we'll classify them however we need to. All right? And we're going to get into some of that. Look, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to go real deep. I'm not going to get into the genetics and the DNA of all of it. I'm just going to leave it as they're all really really cool and awesome insects. They are insects, man. They have wings. They have three main body parts. They have six legs and they have antenna. All right? Six legs three main body parts, two antenna. That makes them an insect. Six, three, two. Always remember that, guys, okay? So, let's get into those differences. I wanna give you that disclaimer, though, that, that, look, everything I tell you in regards to the difference between butterflies and moths, there's probably a butterfly or there's definitely a moth out there somewhere that will break that rule every single time. So I don't want you to I don't want you to engrave this stuff into stone. I don't want you to come back at me and tell me how wrong I am about things. I'm telling you right now that all of the differences I'm going to discuss, I'm either going to show you how things are different and how some of these moths are out here breaking the rules or I'm just going to let you know that there are there are a lot of really amazing moths and butterflies out there that don't exactly do things the way we think they should be doing them. Okay? So, get the DNA out of the door. Let's get into the rules. Let's talk about the, the big differences between butterflies and moths. The first thing people need to understand is most, most moths are going to fly at night. So, if you put up bright lights at nighttime, you're going to get moths. You're going to get lots of good moths coming in and lots of other insects too because, you know, nocturnal insects, they come to lights. How weird is that? Okay? But, Moths are going to come in, and most of us recognize moths as things that fly at night. Cool? All right. Moths also are going to have, most moths are going to have antenna that can be feathery or bushy, or even if they're long and thin antenna, they're not going to necessarily be clubbed antenna. Okay? So if it's got the clubbed antenna, there's a real good chance it's a butterfly. Okay? At the same time, because moths, most moths are coming out at night, they're going to have these thick, fuzzy bodies. And I'm not going to go into details about the fact those hairs are actually modified scales because that gets real high tech. So I'm just going to call it as they have fat, fuzzy bodies and that's to keep them warm at night. How neat is that? I mean, if you're going to fly around and the temperatures are low and there's going to be frost or there's going to be dew and things are going to get chilly, you need to have some insulation. So moths will have long scales, hairs, if you will, on their bodies, on their wings. And that keeps them a little warmer, keeps that moisture, keeps that dew from, from connecting and soaking into the wings. It gives them some insulation, which is really cool. All right? Everything about insects is about surviving one more day. Moths, butterflies, no different. They're all adapted to what they're going to do. Okay? So, talk about the six legs and the fact that they're an insect. We talk about the fact that they're going to probably come out at night in most cases. We're going to talk about that they have the antenna that aren't always feathery. And we're going to talk about cocoons. And this gets delicate because this is a big deal. Not all moths make cocoons, but there are very, very few butterfly larvae, the caterpillars, very few butterfly caterpillars are going to make a cocoon. 
Doesn't mean there aren't some out there that do it, because I think I know of one. But cocoons are super cool. Cocoons are basically silk and leaves wrapped around what will be the eventual chrysalis. The caterpillar makes a cocoon. But why? Because odds are butterflies don't do that. So why would a moth go to all the trouble to make this cool cocoon? This is a Cecropia moth right here in Pennsylvania. Why would they go to all that trouble? That's basically a sleeping bag. Think about it this way. They're going to be in this cocoon all winter long. That's the big difference right there. The moths that make these cocoons almost, and I'm going to say almost because I know some that don't do it, but almost always stay in those cocoons for the entire winter. And in doing so, they need to keep that frost from directly coming in contact. This keeps them warm, keeps them protected, keeps the birds from getting to them and a lot of the predators from getting into them real easily. Makes it harder for predators to eat them, keeps them alive one more day. You know why? Because everything about insects is about surviving one more day. Cocoons, super cool. Inside the cocoon, no different than a butterfly. Inside the cocoon, there's going to be a chrysalis or a pupa, if you will. And pupa are just what, that's the stage just before the butterfly or the moth comes out. This is a regal moth chrysalis. It's actually kind of a smaller one, so hopefully you can see that okay. It's just a neat moth chrysalis. But this is what would normally be inside a cocoon, even though these guys pupate underground. Breaks the rules, doesn't make a cocoon, pupates in the ground. But this is what would be inside here, as far as regular moths are concerned, normal moths, if you will. Okay? Same idea. They all start out as an egg, they go to a larva, they create a chrysalis, in which case they'll hang out for a while, maybe all winter, maybe not, and then they emerge as an adult. That's the life cycle. You know, now it's, it's not real hard for us to fathom because we always see caterpillars and we see the adults, of course, flying around too. So we understand that, that butterflies and moths come from caterpillars. Just not everybody realizes that, that most moths will make a cocoon and then hang out for such a long period of time. Such cool stuff. Cool? All right, good. Let's talk about sizes. All right? Sizes are important because all moths are going to come in all shapes, all sizes, all colors. The little guy on the top is a small little pyralid, and the big guy on the bottom is the same kind of moth I did the mounting program on, if you, if you caught that last week. I, did a, a, I mounted up an atlas moth. That's not the largest moth in the world. There's a bigger one. There's a Hercules moth coming out of Malaysia, but that's the atlas moth. And look at the size difference between those two, because that little pyralid, He's not even the smallest moth either. They get a lot smaller than that. We're talking microscopic kind of size. Really, really super small. So moths, butterflies, just like all the insects, they come in all shapes, all sizes, and all colors. Kind of neat, right? All right, so we understand the life cycle. Let's talk about a lifespan of a moth, all right? Because this gets kind of interesting. Moths are neat. When they hatch out of a cocoon, Obviously, it's going to be a male or a female. And in this case, we're going to look at a female Luna moth. How neat is she? Hopefully, she doesn't fly away. It's a female Luna moth. Now, these are pretty common right here in Pennsylvania, where I'm from. This is one I reared last year and hatched out. And they're starting to come out this week. I've been popping Luna cocoons all week. But... Female moths, once they leave that cocoon, are only going to live for about four days. Four days, guys. Okay, the cycle is, that's about an average. The cycle is simple. They're going to use a pheromone. These female moths are going to come out of that cocoon, and they're going to hang off of that cocoon, and they're going to put out a pheromone. That's like perfume. Okay, smells real good. The males dig it. So those males are going to pick that up. They use their antenna. Remember, the insects use their antenna to smell with. The males are going to pick that, an that, that smell up with their antenna in the dark, and they're going to fly in their way. They're going to fly into the wind, and they're going to track down these female moths by smelling that pheromone. And they can pick that pheromone up for miles away. So it's not real hard to attract in a male if you put a caged female out sometimes. 
But these are super, super beautiful moths. Those long tails, again, everything is designed to protect this moth. If she decides she has to fly, she can go out and fly around. And the Luna moths and a lot of these other large moths like this have those long tails. And those tails are to protect them from bats. It breaks up the signal and the sonar coming in. It also makes it hard for a bat to come in behind this moth and take a bite out of it. Tails are going to hit him and smack him and confuse him. And those tails are designed to protect this moth from bats. But everything is still designed to keep this moth alive. The problem is she's only going to live for about four days in the wild because she's going to attract a mate. That male moth is going to fly his way in, they're going to mate, and then she is going to lay about 500 to 700 eggs. Five to 700 eggs in a moth like this. Crazy stuff. And she's going to lay those eggs, and as soon as those eggs are laid, she dies. Four days average for a female moth. Because their job is is to get it done. Their job is to keep the food chain fat and happy. Look, insects are the smallest thing on the food chain, respectively. Okay, Everything bigger than an insect is going to try and kill it, either because it's hungry or because we don't like them. Either way, they have to live another day. That's all they're trying to do is live one more day. And nature gives them every opportunity they can to survive in order to produce food to feed the food chain, because that's what insects do. They're keeping the food chain fat and happy. Now this moth does not even have a mouth. Because a large majority of moths that are out there flying around don't have mouths. They have nothing to eat with. They're going to survive only on what they ate as a caterpillar and what they can reserve since hatching out of that cocoon. They don't need to eat because that's eating is not their job. Surviving is their job and keeping the food chain happy. That's their job. So nature doesn't even give them a mouth to eat with. So four days, man. Not a long time, but long enough for these moths to get the job done. Kind of cool. All right? See, so I understand. All shapes, all sizes, all colors, and everything, just like the insects, everything is built to keep them alive one more day. So let's get into why they even have wings. All right? If the female moths can hang off of that cocoon and just attract the mates to them. Well, and obviously the males have to have wings. It helps if you have wings, you can fly your way up into the trees or fly your way and find that female a lot quicker. So having wings is important, but not all moths have wings. Check this out. This is a webworm. This is a webworm moth, very common moths. They're here in the fall and in the spring. They'll be showing up here anytime here in Pennsylvania. And check it, man. The one on top is a female sitting on top of her cocoon, and she does not have wings. It's a wingless female webworm. And that proves they don't even need wings in the real sense, but they still have them. You know why the biggest reason? The biggest reason for having wings is because that way you can scatter out, you can spread out your numbers, and that way those males who don't live only four days, the males live about two weeks. They can mate and they can move on. And then they can mate and they can move on. And they can actually help create even more by doing so. And they can spread themselves out a lot more and keep a lot more animals, you know, fat and happy. That's their job. Cool? All right. So check it. What time of day are they going to fly? Most moths, most moths are going to fly during the nighttime. All right? Most people think that. But you've got moths right in your garden every summer and you probably don't even know it. You have the hummingbird moth. Looks like a bumblebee, looks like a hummingbird, acts like a hummingbird. It hovers around your flowers, sips in there, it dips its proboscis. This thing definitely has a mouth part, and it, and it dips the proboscis into the nectar of your flowers, and it will suck the nectar right out with that big straw-like proboscis. And it acts just like a hummingbird by doing so. And people find these all the time, and they don't realize it's a day-flying moth. How neat is that? Even has kind of clear wings, mimics a bee, acts like a hummingbird. Very, very cool stuff. All right? You guys got these in your gardens every year. If you have butterfly bushes, I guarantee you have them, because they love butterfly bushes. Butterfly bushes are invasive, by the way, so if you have them, you shouldn't. Just saying. Yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. Look, there's other things that are flying during the day. There's five countries, five countries 
in this box. And these are all moths. How cool are those moths? Everything in this box is a moth that flies during the day. And some of them will act, I mean, they, they literally act like butterflies. The difference is they're not necessarily feeding on flowers. Some of them, like the buck moth right in the middle, they don't even have a mouth. They come out and fly around during the day just to find mates. Some of these other ones actually have mouth parts and they'll, they'll suck sediment and, and minerals off the mud and things like that. But they're not even butterflies and they're beautiful. So don't let color get in the way of the difference between butterflies and moths. Look, man, there are a lot of really beautiful moths out there, just like there are some very beautiful butterflies. How neat is that? And I could, I could go into the Madagascar, leave it to Africa, man, the Madagascar sunset moth and watch what happens to the bottom of this moth. This is a moth, not a butterfly. Look at that. How amazing is that? That's a moth, man. That's, that's not, that doesn't make sense. But that's nature doing what nature does. These moths are going to go out there and they're going to imitate butterflies. They're going to mimic butterflies. And they've adapted to fly during the day instead of night. They're breaking the rules because that's what they do. Kind of cool? These are Cassineids. Check this out. These are Central and South American moths. And they come out and they fly during the day, right in the middle of the day, sometimes the hottest part of the day. This is one of the few things that when I'm in the tropics, I can go out in the middle of the day at the real hot point when a lot of other stuff shuts down, and I can go out and I can find Cassineids flying around in the rainforest. This is a cool kind of stuff that's going to be there. And, and if you notice, some of them are brightly colored, but, but in general, they just look like moths. There's nothing, I mean, they're beautiful in my sense, but for most people, they would look at these and they would just see, you know, it's a bug or it's a moth. And it looks kind of like a moth by its colors. Doesn't, doesn't have what a lot of people perceive should be a butterfly. Moths in the daytime. Crazy stuff, right? Crazy stuff. So let's talk about butterflies, all right? We can spend all day talking about moths because remember, they're probably all moths anyway. But let's talk about butterflies in the sense that most butterflies are going to fly during the day. Most. Okay. You, there are some out there that tend to not to do that, but that's okay. Breaking the rules. I love it. Okay. Most butterflies are going to have thin little bodies, not a lot of, you know, fuzz and fur on them. I do know a swallowtail up in Canada that will break that rule, though. Okay. And most butterflies are going to make a chrysalis and not form a cocoon. Okay, they don't have to build the sleeping bag. The reason for that is butterflies generally don't overwinter. And I'm going to talk about that because I know where everybody's, everybody's going to go, ah, I get all crazy about that. So butterflies generally don't overwinter, but there are some that will. But what they do when they make their chrysalis Without that, without the cocoon, remember, they don't make a sleeping bag for the winter time. They'll make that chrysalis and they're going to hatch anywhere from five to 12 days. And that's a big margin because butterflies have that bigger, bigger, uh, you know, that broad of an area. But, but they're going to, they're going to emerge out of that, that chrysalis in anywhere from five to 12 days. And they don't generally overwinter often enough that you don't see butterflies, um, you know, adapting to need a cocoon the way moths do, because most moths are going to overwinter. So butterflies will do that. There are butterflies, there are butterflies out there right in your backyard, right here in Pennsylvania, that will, they will overwinter as an egg, they will overwinter as a caterpillar, they will overwinter as a chrysalis, and they definitely overwinter as an adult. Some of our earliest butterflies that we see hatching out and emerging out and flying around in our springtime are going to be those types of, of insects. They're going to be butterflies that are overwintering uh, in one shape, you know, one way, shape, or form. Um, but as soon as it warms up a little bit, they click on, they warm up, and they come to life. And they either finish out their life cycle and they punch early in the season, or they just wake up from their winter sleep. The catch is, man, here's the big trick to overwintering. 
these insects find a way to keep themselves protected from direct frost. Direct frost will kill insects. So a lot of you know adult butterflies that overwinter are going to overwinter inside hollowed out trees, or they're going to they're going to overwinter in garages and sheds or overhangs, different places like that. I find a lot of overwintering chrysalises. I find them actually up in uh, underneath window sills. It's a real weird place, but I think they just randomly crawl to a place that feels protected, and then they get a little bit of sun, and that keeps them temperate and warm. But at the same time, as long as that frost doesn't get to them, they're good. Okay, over around air conditioners, that's also a good place. Air conditioning units is a good place to find overwintering insects because you know why? Because heat is escaping from the house all winter long or that building all winter long and just enough heat to keep it uh, you know warm enough if you will that they don't freeze up they find a way man so you know not needing a cocoon is not necessarily a, a huge trait and not necessarily a necessity for butterflies they, they find a way to get the job done nature always finds a way how cool is that lifespan on butterflies average butterfly is going to live about two weeks that's average okay yes there's a migrating monarch that takes about five months that's an exception to the rule without a doubt man that's a cool bug that can you know migrate all the way down into southern california and mexico and hang out for the entire winter and then you know start flying its way back up now they don't normally make it all the way north they'll lay their eggs and die and then those next generations are what will push north so so Pennsylvania doesn't normally see monarchs in big numbers until June or maybe July. It takes a long time for those butterflies to work their way back up. But you get it, man. Two weeks is about average for butterflies. But either way, when the females are done, when the females are finished laying their eggs, they die. That's the rule. They can't keep living on. They've done their job, and nature calls them out. Nature kills them. That's how it works. All right? Everybody understand that? Good. So let's get into a couple halfway points because this is where things start getting weird for some people. All right, let's talk about the oldest family of butterflies that I know of. There may be something new they've found, but these are the Caladulas. All right, these are an exceptional, neat little butterfly. Comes out of Brazil. And guess what? This guy, these little guys, they are almost moths, but they're almost butterflies. And they've put them in with the moths, but the reality is, is that they're more of a butterfly. This is a weird bug, man. These things are like a missing link between butterflies and moths. Again, one of the oldest butterfly moth families around, the Caladulas. Super, super cool moths. Because, you know, like I said, they're finding out they're all moths anyway. Super cool. Now, if you want to look at something that's a little more recent, might work as a nice halfway point, that gets us into the skippers. And there's a whole bunch of countries in this box. These are from all over the place. These aren't just Pennsylvania. But skippers. Skippers are going to have traits of both mutter butterflies and moths. A little bit of both mixed in here. These guys fly during the day. I don't see too many skippers coming to lights at night. Although Vernon Brew in Louisiana could probably prove me wrong on that. But I don't see too many skippers coming to lights at nighttime. These guys are really regularly daytime flyers. They require that sunlight, I think. that They've adapted pretty hard to the daytime. So you're not going to see these guys flying around too often at night. But definitely a crossover and a very close relative to moths. And you'll even see some insect books that will describe butterflies, moths, and skippers because the author has a real hard time putting them into either category. And that's understandable. It's getting to the point, you know, that that's, there's so much, re so much research on all that DNA being done. It's crazy stuff. So, you understand, flight times, not a difference between butterflies and moths. There's going to be flying at daytime. They're going to be flying at night. Either way, they've adapted to their cause. They've adapted to the predators, and they're just trying to stay alive one more day. Let's talk about color. Guys, this gets crazy. Because look, there are butterflies out there that have almost no color at all. Almost no color at all. These are glass wings. They're satyrids. It's a satyrid butterfly. It comes out of Central and South America. And there's no color. So why in the world would a butterfly have no color on the wings at all? Well, remember, 
They're the smallest thing in a food chain and everything's trying to eat them. So guess what? If you're invisible, that makes you really hard to see. And if they can't see you, they can't eat you. Glass wing satirids, way cool stuff. The makeup of a wing of a butterfly is incredible. It's also very high tech. I'm gonna try and simplify. I'm gonna try and keep this simple for everybody. And whether you're five year olds or 95 year old, I think you can understand how I'm gonna do this. All right, the makeup of a butterfly and moth wing is basically veins and a, and a membrane. And then there's scales, the colors. Are, are coated on the top and the bottom of the wing. That thickens the wing, it gives it protection, it makes it a little sturdier so they can fly and move. And at the same time, that's gonna keep rain and moisture and, and ice and things, frost, from connecting and soaking in and killing those bugs. So that way, that way they're weatherproofed. Now, those scales, if you will, I say scales and people right away are gonna think, you know, snakes and reptiles very similar, not the same makeup, not the same kind of material being used, but the chitin and, and the exoskeleton you know, that, that are used to make scales of butterflies and moths, they're like roof shingles and they overlap. So that rain and that, that moisture sheets away. Now that also gives them color because when you don't have scales, you don't have any color. Your wings are clear. So when you have scales, you can be any color that you want. Whatever color nature decides you should have, whatever you've adapted to needing, you can do. And morpho butterflies are a classic example of the ultimate color of butterflies. Blues and purples and iridescent greens. Look, man, I've looked at, I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of bugs over the years, but blues and purples and iridescent greens, that is not... That's not normal, all right? Even, even our sky is not blue. That's the atmosphere that makes it look blue. Blue is something nature creates for a real purpose, for an exact reason, and guess why? Blues and purples and iridescent greens are used to attract mates. They all do it, okay? Insects use blues and purples and iridescent greens to attract mates. Sometimes they use pheromones, that smelly stuff that the moths use in the dark, other times, there's day flying moths out there that are going to be using the blues and the purples and the iridescent greens. Whatever they need to do, however they got to get it done. But blue is a super neat color. And those scales on the wings, guys, that gets fun with morpho butterflies. Check it. Bring him out again. Yeah, we'll do a, we'll do a different one because all different butterflies. That is not a blue butterfly. It looks blue, but it's not a blue butterfly. It's white or even clear. And what happens is those little sh those shingles, those roof, roof shingles, if you will, those scales that are on those wings, there's millions and millions of them to cover the wing surface of a moth or a butterfly. And in the case of morpho butterflies, in the case of these blue ones, Every one of those roof shingles, every one of those scales is a prism. And a light comes in and then it refracts and it comes off as blues and purples and iridescent greens. I'm going to move this one around a little bit. You can pick up some of those colors. Look how phenomenal that is. Blues and purples and iridescent greens. And they use that to attract mates. The boys are trying to get the attention of the girls, so you find colors that girls like. And guess what? Girls love purple. All right, we're running out of time. I got to get going. All right, I got to keep moving. But understand, millions of little prisms on the top of these morpho butterflies, and that creates millions of individual colors. That's how they get their iridescence. That's how they make those colors happen. Nature is so cool in the way it does things. So defenses, we're talking about colors. Insects are all about colors. Moths and butterflies are no different. They're defenses, they can be toxic. There are toxic butterflies, a monarch butterfly, reds, oranges, yellow colors, indicates it's poisonous to those butterflies. Meaning if they eat it, it can actually make them sick. Moths and butterflies have the same ability to do that. There are moths out there that are gonna defend themselves through color. But the trick is, 
most moths are going to rest with the wings flat and open. Butterflies rest with their wings closed. So a moth, when a moth sleeps or a moth is resting hard, their protection is going to be on the top of the wings because this is what the predators are going to see. And obviously you're looking at two big, huge eyeballs. And guess what? Predators don't like being looked at. They want to jump out, grab their food, and go back in. If it's staring at you, man, that is going to freak you out. And those big fake eyeballs do a great job of keeping this moth protected. I've seen that in action. I watched a sparrow at a gas station one time get freaked out by eyeballs on a polyphemus that was on the ground, and he pecked at the eyeball and flew away. Never touched a moth. He could have grabbed the moth and flown away and had a smorgasbord out of that. Instead, the eyes worked, and the, butter and the moth gets to survive. Butterflies do the same thing. Check it out. This is the owl butterfly. This is a Caligo, comes out of Central and South America. And look at the design on it. Yes, it looks like, a, like an owl, but that's not how it works, guys. That's not how it works. Butterflies close their wings. So this is all you get to see. So now it becomes what could be the head of a snake or a lizard or a turtle. It's all about big fake eyeballs and lots of butterflies and lots of insects and moths are going to use fake eyeballs to survive another day. Guys, that's what it is. That's what they do. It's all about living one more day. Insects, moths, butterflies, they're all coming in all shapes, all sizes, all colors. How cool is that? No matter how you look at it, they're all insects. No matter how you look at it, they're all important. The ecosystem needs them, nature needs them, and you and I need them. The planet needs these things to survive. Like them or don't like them. You know, you got your, you know, motophobia. Get over that, man, because you need these things in your world and the planet needs these things to survive. Guys, if you like what you see here, then you got to go to my website, ryanthebugman.com. ryanthebugman.com. Go on that contact page, hit me up, and let me know you like what you're seeing. You can find me on YouTube, Ryan the Bugman. You can also find me Facebook. You can find me all over social media now. It's happening big. But either way, track me down. Let me know that you like what you see here. Subscribe. Either way. Keep checking out every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. You can find me here. Guys, I want you to be well. I want you to be safe. And I want you to be kind. It's an angry world right now. Be kind. Most of all, be here every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Have a great day, guys.